We turn this morning to a verse found in the epistle to the Ephesians and chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. We believe this letter was written about A.D. 62 during Paul's first imprisonment. Some ten years before, in A.D. 51, he had visited Ephesus at the end of his second missionary journey. And that visit is mentioned in Acts 18. But it was a short visit as he was hastening at that time to Jerusalem to be uh, at the Feast of Pentecost to preach the gospel to the crowds there. But a few years later, AD 54, he visited Ephesus again, and this time he stayed there for three years, and that visit is described in Acts 19. When later still he came to write this letter to the Ephesians, he wrote it so as to set out the great doctrines of the gospel. Here revealed in these chapters is the faith of God's elect, the faith which was once delivered to the saints. And as he opens up this tremendous theme of the gospel in all its fullness, Paul begins in chapter 1 with God, what God has willed, what God has done. Then in chapter 2, he proceeds to man, the state he's in, what need he has of divine power to deliver him. In chapter 1, we have a God planning our salvation. Chapter 2, we have God fulfilling the plan and bringing it all into wonderful reality. But when we come to verse 10 of chapter 2, we come across these words which struck me again this week, particularly the words with which the verse begins, we are his workmanship. There are three things that I want to draw your attention to from this verse. The first is the God of grace. We are his workmanship. And the verses which immediately precede tell us that whatever God does for us or in us, it is by grace. So the God of grace. Secondly, the beauty of holiness. We are his workmanship. We'll explore what kind of work it is which he brings to pass in us. The God of grace, the beauty of holiness, and thirdly, the pathway of obedience unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So three headings. First of all, the God of grace. The realization comes to us immediately from this verse that God is the one 
who has made us what we are. Now, that is true in two ways, really. It is true in the first place, so far as natural creation goes. God has made us. He is the creator. Thy hands, the psalmist says, have made me and fashioned me. Well, it's true naturally, but it's true spiritually of the spiritual creation. What we are as men, we owe to God. What we are as Christians, we owe to God. We are a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. And it's God that has made us men. And it is God who has made us believers. We are, in that double sense, his workmanship. And they're not altogether unrelated, these two things, the natural creation and the spiritual creation, because in the natural creation, not only of ourselves, but of the created world, God has shown his ability to effect change. He is called in the scriptures the creator of men. We remember the words of Isaiah 40 and verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. And in creating the world and all worlds and worlds unknown, God has shown his almighty power. By faith we understand that the worlds were made by the word of God. And he has made us anew because we had fallen into sin, because we were defiled, and because we had a propensity to evil. And God has performed a second work upon us, evidencing the same kind of power. And in this second work, he has given us a new heart and a new spirit. And he's made us a new man, as Paul describes it in chapter 4 and verse 24. Created after God. So God is at the beginning of this whole thing. God in his power has exerted himself again to restore us and to deliver us from evil. And the third truth emerging is that in this great grace is evidenced. Now by grace we mean God's free and undeserved favour. It's mentioned in chapter 1 of this epistle. He predestinated us according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. So the plan of what God was going to do was a plan devised and formed by grace. We didn't deserve it. We'd done nothing to warrant it. God, because he would bless us, 
decreed to restore us. And in chapter 2, we read further in 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You see, man was in a sad and sorry state. He was ruined, and he was decayed. In a state of defection, and in a state of corruption. But God had good thoughts towards him, even so. And God willed to bring him back again to what he was originally and to make him even better than he was at the first. Oh, the amazing grace of God. Theologians speak of God's purposing grace, which is the grace of the Father. His redeeming grace, which is the grace of the Son. And his dispensing grace, which is the grace of the Holy Spirit. God loved us, pure grace. He bought us, pure grace. He saved us, pure grace. We are then his workmanship. Whose workmanship? The workmanship of the God of grace. Now, friends, this work which God has done, let it be said that it is begun in regeneration. It has continued in sanctification and it will be perfected in glorification. <coughs> It's an impressive, an impressive work. And he's done this through his word as at the first creation, but this time through the word of the gospel. And in all his people, a good work has been done. And it's proceeding. And one day it will be finished. We are changed, we are being changed, and we shall be changed. And what's the end of all this workmanship? What good is it? Where does it lead? Well, first of all, the workmanship in the believer is such as restores him to communion and to fellowship with God. In our natural, fallen, guilty state, we, we could not deal with God. But he has worked in us to make that possible. He's renewed us. He's revived us so as to bring us to himself. The second thing is we are made useful to God. We are able to serve him. We are able to fulfill his will. Because we're not broken and rejected. We are healed and we are forgiven. 
we are therefore able to commune with God, we're able to serve the Lord in the fellowship of his church, and one day, because we've been renewed, we shall be able to enter heaven. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, he that has wrought us for this thing is God. And he has worked in us that one day admission will be given us into heaven. In that instant, ere we enter, we shall be changed. The work of grace will be completed. And there will be no sin in us anymore. No evil, either in our nature or in our lives. But we shall be like him in all his holiness. Oh, the God of grace. No wonder the apostle says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. If God had left us to our own devices, if God had left us where Satan abandoned us, if God had left us in our sin and in our wickedness, where would we be? We owe everything to the God of grace, Everything to the grace of God. Which leads me secondly to the beauty of holiness. We are his workmanship. The idea is there are many things in the world that God has made and we only have to open our eyes and survey creation to see that. But this is the masterpiece. Man restored. Man renewed. Made new. Is God's ultimate workmanship. He has done a good work in us. Think of the change in our condition. We were once condemned, no longer. He has changed our condition by justification from being condemned to being pardoned. And he has changed our frame and our outlook by sanctification. He has given us hearts which love him, spirits which fain would follow him. And the result is we are not only changed as far as our state is concerned, but we are changed as far as our lives are concerned. It's a complete change. All things are passed away. Everything's become new. The Apostle speaks of our whole spirit and soul and body being sanctified. Initially, of course, in regeneration. Progressively in ongoing sanctification the spirit or the soul is sanctified all its qualities are restored so that we we don't love what things we should hate we don't desire those things that are forbidden or it should not be so because he's changed he's changed the very nature within. And the body is sanctified. And the body is now 
hallowed as the temple of the Holy Ghost who is given to us. And the body make up the members of Christ. We are the Lord's. So that in the soul we want the utmost for the highest and in the body we will seek to secure that. Thus God makes way for the beauty of holiness. And it is beautiful, isn't it? That phrase comes from the Psalms, such as Psalm 29, who worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. When we think of God and his beauty, wherein does it lie? It lies in his holiness. There is none so holy as the Lord. That's his beauty. And he's made us like himself. The beginnings of it here. The end of it hereafter. So the Spirit has imparted grace to us. And he's wrought a good work. We believe. We repent of sin. We desire to follow God. That's a good work. The evidence of a good work done. But he does more than granting these desires and purposes. He preserves it. It's a wonderful thing. Thomas Boston says in one of his sermons, preserved as a spark of fire in the midst of an ocean. What he means is it's, it's an amazing thing that grace is maintained. When you see the waves and the billows of corruption all around us, it should be extinguished, but it isn't, because each believer is kept by the power of God. He plants it, he preserves it, he excites it or quickens it. Sometimes we are, are stirred to go on with the Lord and to renew our promises to him and to serve him best of all. It is God who does it. It is he which worketh in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. He strengthens it. Strengthened by his spirit in the inner man. And so despite all opposition and all that is brought against the work of grace, it will endure because God means it one day to stand entire and perfect in the heavenly country. So what is this workmanship wrought in us? It's the beauty of holiness. Let me just briefly describe it to you. And we shall be lost in sheer wonderment, I think, when we consider what God has wrought. There is in us, as believers, a new life. A new life. Not the old life. Which loves sin more than God. And gladly followed wickedness, but a new life has been given to us. The life which is hid with Christ in God. The life of which Paul says, the life that I now live. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me.
we've got a, a new life, a new beginning, new resources, new experiences. We've got a new knowledge. We know God. We never knew him before. But we know him now as our God. The God who is at hand every day to hear our prayers and to help us in all our need. We know him. Every day we prove him. We are sure that he will not fail us. We have peace. Peace which passes understanding because peace which can be there and enjoyed in the midst of trouble. The world can understand that. That we have peace in God. That however bad the present, the future will be bright. However much we struggle, we shall ultimately be brought out of these things and out of all tribulation. And so peace undergirds us because we know that God, God will not fail us. And we have joy because he blesses us, not as the world considers the only way to bless, and that is outwardly and externally, but he, he blesses us inwardly with comforts and with supports and with hopes and grace is buoyant in that it keeps us afloat these are some of the things God has done in our hearts and oh it's it's to the glory of God God be thanked, says the Apostle. I obtained mercy. I'll never get over that. I obtained mercy. He called me by his grace. I will never get over that. He changed me and is changing me and will change me from glory to glory. I'll never get over that. A Christian is a wonderful person. God has made him as he is. He's wonderful now, but he's going to appear more wonderful in the world to come. And God will be praised then by the redeemed and all the angels of heaven forever doing such a thing and creating in miserable earthworms the beauty of holiness. Can you see what God has done? He's made us and fashioned us like himself because there was no better model And therefore he has formed us in his own image to be like him. And one day we shall be fully like him. So the God of grace, the beauty of holiness, and then more briefly the pathway of obedience. We are created... In Christ Jesus, with reference to Christ, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We see why the God of grace created the beauty of holiness, that we may walk the path of obedience and perform those good works. The good works are the works done from a good heart.
good works are works done according to a good rule, the law of God. Good works are works performed out of gratitude for what God has done in saving his people. Good works are works done to the glory of God. When he changes us, he puts our feet in the good way. And he says, walk this way until your walking days are done. It's the way of obedience. And it's the way of doing what pleases me. And it's the way of living the good life. Unto good works, which God hath ordained that we should walk in them. And brethren and sisters, if we are Christians, that's what we're doing this morning. We're walking the new way. We're walking the way of God's revealed will. We're walking the narrow way which leads to eternal life. God, keep us on this way until the way ends and the journey's done and we are at home with God, with our Saviour and with the Blessed Spirit and all his people who will sing to the glory of the God of grace who will appear then in the beauty of full and perfect holiness and who will have finished the journey doing their good works, taking every opportunity to evidence what God has done in them. That's what we're about. My Weary friend, keep walking. My afflicted friend, keep walking. My doubting friend, keep walking. This is the way. Walk ye in it. The destination is before you, seen by faith. Soon you will arrive at the gates of the eternal city. And for all those who have walked the good way, the gates will open. And you will be blessed forevermore. Amen.